Ladies and gentlemen, Katrina Kittle. Good morning. The novelist Ernest Hemingway said, the world breaks everyone, and afterwards, some are strong at their broken places. I love that. Every one of my novels is a variation on that theme. Human resilience fascinates me. The way people get stronger at their broken places. I don't write about people getting broken. I write about people putting themselves back together. But I'm able to write what I write because of having been broken. <laughs> I've come to learn that getting broken is almost a necessary ingredient for being a good writer. And I don't mean as far as providing material. I don't believe a writer has to have actually experienced everything they write about. I write fiction. I make stuff up. That's my job. <laughs> but personal tragedy is what develops empathy. And empathy, absolutely, is a necessary ingredient to be a good writer. I teach a lot of creative writing classes, and empathy is the one aspect of the craft of fiction that I don't know how to teach. All I know to do is to encourage people to look for the gifts and the opportunities in their own personal disasters. Now, just to be clear, when I say gifts, you have to imagine that Okay, someone has given you a diamond, but they have handed it to you wrapped in a steaming, poopy diaper. You have to dig through some shit to find it. <laughs> but you can find it if you decide to. Everybody suffers. Writers, all artists, really, just use that suffering a little bit differently. Every one of my novels has started from a broken place. Years before I even had an inkling that I wanted to be a writer, I lost people that I loved to AIDS. I was in the dance world and then the theater world, and those two communities got hit hard in the early waves of AIDS. Years later, I'm teaching high school theater in English, and I hear my students say blood-chilling things about AIDS and the people who have it. Now, don't get me wrong, these are good students, good people. But they were young, and they were ignorant, like most people were about AIDS in the early 90s. And it struck me that I could perhaps write a story that put a human face on AIDS for people like those students. And so my first novel, Traveling Light, was the story of a woman who comes home to care for her brother in what is obviously going to be his last year of life. And in that novel, I created a character named Grandma Anna, the protagonist's grandmother. Grandma Anna is Polish. She spent time in a Nazi labor camp for hiding Jews in the hayloft of her dairy barn, but she will not accept her grandson's homosexuality, and she will not accept his partner. When I brought early chapters of that novel to my writing groups, they all called me on what a one-dimensional caricature Grandma Anna was. I had written her as this cardboard cutout of a villain, and I realized that she was my dumping ground for all of my intolerance for people I thought were intolerant. <laughs> Empathy forces you to consider an opposing viewpoint. I realized that neither I nor my protagonist had ever actually considered the grandmother's view. She loves her grandson. She cherishes him. She sincerely believes and fears that he will burn in hell. What would it take to ask her to change? What would it take to ask me to change something I felt so strongly about? Empathy takes you inside the mind and the heart of another. And I was able to call upon my own broken places to get me there. So several rewrites later, I had managed to soften my protagonist a bit, and I made Grandma Anna more multidimensional. Still flawed, still stubborn, but more human. 
more real. And she became a character that I'm asked about most often in interviews and by readers. So I take a time that broke me and I rewrite it. I, I take a true experience and I channel it into a completely made up scenario to give it emotional authenticity. That authenticity is a gift from having been broken. Using it is the glue that helps me get stronger at my own broken places and using it helps me make a story real. Another time that temporarily broke me was being diagnosed with cancer. I haven't written directly about my cancer yet, but I have used it to make other stories real. And before I go on, I should say that I am four years cancer-free and absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The day that I found out I had cancer, I had had a biopsy earlier in the week. I'd had them before. I wasn't too worried. And I'm driving to dinner plans, and I miss a phone call because my phone is buried in my bag. And so before I go to the dinner, I pull over into this parking lot to listen to the voicemail. And it's my doctor. It's after 5 on a Friday, and her message says, this is my personal cell number. I want you to call me, it doesn't matter what time. Well, that can't be good. <laughs> and it was like I totally split. The intellectual side of me knew exactly what she was going to tell me. It was obvious, right? It was so clear. But this emotional part of me was like, nah. And so this chipper little part of me calls her back immediately. And when she says the thing that this side knew she was going to say, they found cancer, I was completely unprepared. That parking lot tilted. My scalp shrank, and it was really hard to breathe. And where I was suddenly came into focus. I was in the parking lot of a bowling alley that was closed, and there were three boys skateboarding over here kind of badly. <laughs> and she starts telling me things, and I get out a notebook, and I'm trying to be, you know, the good person taking notes. And I remember I actually wrote the word cancer, like I might forget that part. <laughs> and she's telling me things, and I'm writing them down, but really, my brain is only full of the sound of the scraping of those skateboards. And I don't understand most of what she tells me or most of what I write, and I end up having to call her the next day to go over all of it. But when I first hung up, I just sat there, taking in every detail of that parking lot with that crystal clarity you get in a moment that you know is life-altering. I remember one boy's red shirt was ripped under one arm. I remember the spring sky was this cornflower blue. I remember there was this Taco Bell bag rolling like a tumbleweed toward those boys. I have not written a point-of-view character with cancer yet, but I have written a point of view character who has that same split emotional, visceral reaction to bad news of another kind. Empathy caused another rewrite on a later novel, The Blessings of the Animals. That's the story of a veterinarian's first year post-divorce and this motley crew of rescue animals that ends up rescuing her. Now, I had been working on that manuscript for two years about a woman getting divorced for two years when my own divorce happened. It was a total blindside, I was completely unraveled, and that changed the book. And I don't mean because I was writing my own story, I wasn't at all. Every marriage is as different as every divorce. Okay, full disclosure, there were some things said and done that were too good not to use. <laughs> But for the most part, I mean that it enabled me to get at some emotional truths that I didn't really understand before. But here's the funny thing about empathy. You don't get to pick and choose. Blessings was mainly told through one narrator, the wife of the divorce. But every fourth or fifth chapter was another character who gets their one chapter to have their say before they continue being a player in my protagonist's life. Well. My trusted reader friends and my editor all kept telling me, you have to give the ex-husband his chapter. <laughs> I didn't want to. I mean, come 
on. I wanted to punch him in the throat. I didn't want to give him a voice. I finally conceded because I thought it was the best thing for the book. So calling upon my lessons from Grandma Anna in the first novel, I wrote the Bobby chapter. That is now the third chapter in the novel, and the writing of it changed that book completely for the better. What I hadn't expected, although I should have, is that the writing of it would change me completely for the better. Because to write him well, I had to motivate him. I had to understand his intentions. The reader gets to go inside his head and know all his thoughts and fears and all the things that he's unable to communicate to his wife. Without that chapter, he's this jerk face monster. But with that chapter, he's tragic. He's struggling and sad, and that chapter is the filter through which the reader views him for the rest of the book. When I teach creative writing, when we talk about voice and point of view, I urge my writers to write scenes from opposite perspectives, even if those scenes won't end up in their stories, just to be open to how it might change them. And I tell them over and over again, this will make you better writers. And one day, a student looked up at me and said, it'll make us better human beings. And I thought, yeah, it does. Thank you.